Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk um, a little bit about the NORCORE project, um, which was a, a large um, USDA NIFA-funded um, coordinated agricultural um, project, or CAP. Uh, I think I'm going to start. I was um, um, privileged to be on a, a committee that was sponsored by the National Academy of Sciences, looking at visioning agriculture in the next uh, agricultural research in the next um, about 15 years. And one of the major topics that came up in our deliberations was this idea of convergence. Um, and this is actually one of the big ideas for the future um, of NSF. Uh, Investment. So this is a really important concept for uh, NSF projects that are moving forward into the next decade. And it, of course, approaches this issue of solving these very complex projects or ex complex problems um, or those that are very recalcitrant. In other words, we haven't been able to address them for one reason or another. And convergence research really has two primary characteristics. Um, one is, is that it's driven by a compelling problem. Um, or, a, or a pressing societal need, and there is a deep integration across uh, disciplines. Now, unfortunately, I missed the first pres or the first part of the first presentation, so I hope I'm not um, repeating um, this issue of disciplinary disciplinarity, which um, also has something to do with convergence. And actually, if you look in the literature um, and in the social sciences and medical sciences and, and et cetera, there are three terms that are, tend to be used um, relatively interchangeably, those being multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. And they actually have slightly different meanings. Um, and you can see here, these are some definitions that I took out of a, a, a paper in clinical investi in investigative medicine. There are other definitions um, depending upon um, the source of, uh, of, of the brain trust that sort of wants to talk about these issues of disciplinar disciplinarity. But bottom line is, is that there are subtle differences in, 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 in disciplinarity relative to sharing disciplines and the knowledge within disciplines. What I really like is um, this, this definition that came out of um, a, paper, uh, um, a project that was done also sponsored by NAS on facilitating interdisciplinary research. And they define interdisciplinary as a mode of research by teams or individuals that integrates information, data, techniques, tools, perspectives, concepts, and or theories from two or more disciplines. Um, and um, again, sort of the, the, the sum of the, the, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I would make the argument that the NORACOR project, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, in the rest of this presentation, is probably a pretty good example of this interdisciplinary approach to research. So let me give you some history. I'm going to actually try to tell a story. Um, in 2010, there was a request for proposals that came out um, from NIFA for um, large grants, cap grants, um, generally falling between the 20 to $25 million range for a period of five years. And one of the, there were many requirements of these grants, okay, but one of the major requirements as a coordinated agricultural project was that it must, the project must include at least two of the, of the historical land grant um, um, functions, and those are teaching, um, research, and extension and outreach. And um, at least one third of that had to be, had to be the, the other um, function. And so consequently, they were coordinated because you were bringing in the multiple functions of uh, land grant institutions. So this was kind of fun. I was sitting at my kitchen table. The R RFA came out. And um, I immediately had like three messages from um, colleagues that said, oh, we need to go after this, but you're the person that needs to do it, um, mostly because I'm old and because I have been in the field for a long time, OK? So within about, I would say about three days, I had the team picked out. And um, I used a whole bunch of different criteria to pick out the team, okay? One of the major criteria was these had to be people I could work with. In other words, people who were gonna um, 
put their egos on the shelf, okay, and work for the good of the project. Um, they had to have the right disciplines and right areas of expertise, and you'll see how interdisciplinary this actually ended, ended up being. Um, I wanted to include people who had long histories in the field, but I also wanted to include people who were just starting, because part of building a community is, is to help engage people who are starting their careers. So I wanted to bring in both senior faculty and junior faculty and along, uh, along the way. Um, I also um, was very interested in stakeholder involvement. Um, I think being a president of, I of IAFP has helped a lot in sort of understanding what stakeholder needs are. So stakeholders were really important. And then there were some very strategic things that I considered, like EBSCOR states, okay, or historically underrepresented populations or institutions representing historically underpopulated uh, or underrepresented populations, because those are important factors in, fun in making funding decisions. So that led to the NoraCorps project, which um, was funded. Um, it stands for Norovirus Coordinated um, uh, Outreach, Research, and Education. Um, and um, our long-term goal was to reduce the burden of foodborne disease associated with viruses, particularly norovirus. So it, even though it says norocore, we did do some work with hep A. Um, it was certainly an integrated, multidisciplinary approach. And um, the way we structured it was to have um, six what we called cores, um, or you could call them objectives. Four of those, these top ones, or these uh, right-hand ones here were re largely research-focused, and they were overlaid by an education core and an extension and outreach core. And each of the cores had its own particular central function, okay? And then underneath each of the central functions was a series of projects, um, some of which were interrelated with one another and others were standalone projects. Um, and you can see here that these were our research activities, and they focus largely on basic molecular virology relative to norovirus, to developing better detection methods, to understanding epidemiology and using that information to make risk models, um, to developing b better prevention and control strategies for viruses in the food supply. And then um, under extension outreach and education, we um, sought to translate and dis disseminate um, our knowledge that was gained through the project um, into practices that reached very important key target audiences and stakeholder groups. And in capacity building, we were focused really on building both professional scientific capacity, because viruses have historically been an underrepresented area of research um, in food safety, as well as human capacity. Um, and there were, a, we had a lot of successes in this area um, that I'll talk about in a, in a little greater detail. But bottom line is things like um, reagent exchanges and, um, and a variety, and we did a, a, a small kind of mini grant program where we brought in new investigators over the course of the project. So $25 million for five years. Um, these were ultimately the institutions that received some money, okay, over the course of the project. I think we had 21 institutions, which meant that I had to manage 21 subcontracts. Um, they, you can see they're represented by um, federal agencies, lots and lots and lots of different universities, um, and um, Here's one that's a federal university partnership. Uh, and we also worked, for example, with the National Shellfish Sanitation um, Group. So lots and lots of different um, 
groups received money in the project. Now, the way we worked it is, is we had major collaborators, which was six or seven institutions that each received a million dollars or more. And they formed our executive board. And then the other members of the collaborative filled in um, gaps in knowledge or, um, or other areas that we felt needed to be addressed to, to have a, a, a really collectively um, diverse and inclusive um, project. So this is just a real quick version of the org chart. Um, and I really just want to point out that I, I was the project director. Um, I did have um, stakeholder groups as advisory committees. And then each core had its own set of leads who were responsible for making sure that the, what we said we were going to do in the core activities happened. And these were the, collabor the collaborative institutions under each core. Um, and I would be remiss without really mentioning the importance of these people. So um, the staff members who worked on the project, um, and most, most of whom were located in North Carolina, um, were absolutely critical. So these individuals also formed our executive board. Um, in terms of stakeholder involvement, as I said, um, I think this was a, a good and a difficult part of managing this project was that in viruses, we've got a lot of different stakeholder groups. And this is a list of, of the, stake, the major stakeholder groups. There are others um, that were involved in one way or another in the NoraCore project. And this slide actually provides um, some logos of some, certainly not all of the stakeholder groups or the stakeholder organizations. And I point out in this slide really that um, we went from you know, trade organizations to individual companies uh, to task forces um, to um, things like the US Army. Um, the National Fisheries Institute, Cruise Line Industry Association. So you can see here it was a super diverse group of stakeholders, which actually made for a very, very interesting project because when you get all these people in the room together, they all have these slightly different perspectives. Um, I know um, this idea of a logic model was brought up in a previous presentation. Um, USDA actually required an extensive logic model in the proposal. And um, man, I swore the two days that I spent putting the logic model together, it was so much work. But the reality is, is that this was the guiding, the guiding document for our entire project. And um, you know, we would start with describing the situation, look at our inputs, look at our activities, which were divided into our course, right? Um, look at outputs, and the outputs basically were the sort of the inputs or, or the um, the end products of the individual projects, but then they fed into outcomes, which um, which were both short and long term and were subdivided into knowledge, skills, and action. And one of the things we did, because one of the big issues with logic models is that a lot of times your, your final outcomes really you don't see until the, until the project is over. So we identified both short term outcomes that we thought we might be able to see at the end of the project or by the end of the project, but also long term ones which we probably wouldn't see for five to 10 years after the project was over. Okay, so just a few, and I'm not, this is not a presentation on the things that we did. So um, I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of some of our major um, accomplishments. I was told by our, um, direct, by our um, program leader at USDA if, if we could, um, if our team could propagate human norovirus in vitro, the $25 million was worth it. And I think we probably spent about a million and a half trying to get that to, to work, but it was done by Baylor College of Medicine, and actually we do have just the first step. It needs work in order to be used more widely and, and for, um, for a broader range of purposes, but we do have an in vitro cultivation step for human neural. 
we looked at a whole variety of um, uh, of sanitizers, disinfectants, hand sanitizers, some emerging technologies to inactivate noroviruses. This is just some work that was done by um, Chip Manuel in my lab that looked at, who looked at copper alloys. And actually, 70% or more copper is very effective against human norovirus. We did several um, prevalence studies. This is one um, that looking at the prevalence of uh, of norovirus in um, restrooms in uh, North and South Carolina public restrooms. I don't, some of you might have been involved in the one where we went um, uh, into airports and, and sampled toilets and um, um, sinks in, air, in airports and in, on airplanes. And so we had stakeholders that carried swabs with them while they were flying and then would ship them back to us. Um, we developed um, one of our, our big interests was managing vomiting and fecal episodes, okay? And we, as we learned more about the um, restaurant um, sector, what we realized was that they don't have, that, that probably 80 to 90% of restaurants actually are small, small single um, proprietor owned or very small um, uh, you know, just a group of restaurants. And they don't have the resources that the big guys have. So we produced editable vomit and fecal cleanup guidelines um, that they can just download and use to develop a program in their locations. And then we worked with, um, with uh, CFP in trying to, um, to initiate um, some of that into the, into the upcoming food code um, regulations. And huge social media, I think, every year at IAFP for about four or five years. We did competitions. We did uh, a couple mock outbreaks. We did all kinds of really fun social media things. Um, this, was, uh, this was so much fun. The social media was a blast. OK. And then we did a lot of capacity building. Um, activities, uh, not only our website, but we did have a comprehensive reagent and protocol exchange. Super important because these reagents and protocols were not widely shared or, um, amongst collaborators, and we were able to allow that to happen or to facilitate that because we had the money and because we had the resources and um, communications to put that into place. Um, we developed online um, literature databases, both for the public where only abstracts were available and for our collaborators, educational models, both for grad students and for public health professionals. Um, I mentioned discretionary funding, and we also had both graduate and undergraduate fellowship um, fellowships that we awarded every year. So I'd like to kind of wrap up and talk about some of my, um, my own personal experiences in running a project of this magnitude, both good and positive. Or good, good positive and bad terrible, okay? <laughs> and um, in terms of the project director, um, these really were the functions that I was responsible for um, on behalf of the entire project. But it's also important to note that the collaborators are really important partners, and they're not just kind of there for the ride. And so you do have to engage them in these types of functions and then have this expectation that they are going to be participatory, that they are going to be collaborative, um, that there will be regular communications amongst the collaborators. So what are some important qualities for success? Um, I don't want to say that um, I'm great about all of these things. I'm not sure that I'm the most organized person in the world. Um, but I will say that um, things like being resourceful and being an advocate for the, pro for the, for the project and being flexible, we were faced with changes all the time, um, and having the ability to facilitate communications and collaborations were all really important aspects to make the project successful. So what was most enjoyable? Well, for me, the most enjoyable part was the team building. I mean, it was really fun. It was really fun to see all of these investigators some from epidemiology, some from um, basic virology, some from food science, 
um, some from uh, engineering. I mean, the list goes on. And, and all of the stakeholders together put their diversity of expertise together, um, their diverse perspectives together, their diverse communication styles together, and their diverse personalities together. And there was, and fortunately, if I had not become a scientist, I would have been a clinical psychologist. And there was a whole lot of clinical psychology going on here. And um, so because that's kind of my second interest, um, I really enjoyed that, trying to figure out how you're going to make or, or facilitate people working together um, under these diverse circumstances. I think we were really fortunate because we did have a vision, okay? And I think that's one of the key things for projects like this, is you have to have a very clear vision as to sort of where you're going. And ultimately, most of these people ended up becoming not only colleagues, but became friends. And I say that about the stakeholder groups as well. So it was a blast to watch the science move forward. Um, we had, the exec team had um, meetings about every six months. And so we heard as the cell culture model became um, developed, we heard about, as we knew more about burden of disease and attribution associated with viruses and foods. And we heard about this in real time because we met so frequently. Um, and um, consequently, we were able to kind of get in the weeds because we were hearing about things as they were developing. But at the same time, we were able to keep this big picture perspective. So yeah, you're working on this project or you're working together to make this happen. But this is how it falls out when, the, when you look at it from the standpoint of the big picture. And, um, and working with, I would have to say that to me, probably working with the stakeholders, and this is a surprise because I, I'm an, an academic who does not even have an extension appointment, working with the stakeholders was the funnest part of the project, absolutely. And um, as was mentoring um, junior faculty members and students, and I would say that so much of the time, um, students and junior faculty members get very siloed. And this is an opportunity to allow them to experience the science outside of that silo. And that has incredible benefits because they realize that there's life beyond and in addition to what it is you're studying or what it is you studied or where it is you're starting your career. Um, they also get lots of opportunity to learn interpersonal skills, to interact with a bunch of other people. And this idea of ownership, they have ownership of their own work, but they also have co-ownership in the work of others. And I think that that's a really, particularly where science is going now, that's a very important thing for, faculty, for young faculty members to, um, to learn. Um, and also the fact that, you, you know, you have to be a good citizen. You have to do what you're, what you're going to say you're going to do, and you have to listen to the perspectives of other people. Um, and we were fortunate enough to have the kind of culture and the kind of group where that was respected, um, and, and so consequently people got to um, experience that in a very functional manner. Okay, so where did stakeholders fall in? Well, our stakeholders, we met, we, you know, interacted with um, on a pretty regular basis, but we had, um, we had biannual meetings. So we had meetings with the stakeholders every other year. And um, as I had mentioned, really diverse, really different perspectives, but I think the, a couple of the things that were really important from my perspective relative to the stakeholders was the fact that they helped to shape the direction of the science, okay? Because we wanted to develop science that was gonna end up in practice. 
And we couldn't have done that without talking to the stakeholders. So for example, we didn't spend a lot of time developing methods to detect viruses in foods because we didn't see that as a practical reality for the stakeholders. And yet at the same time, there were other, other things like the fecal vomiting guidelines that was important to the stakeholders. And that's where we spent our time. Okay, frustrations. Oh my gosh. Um, you, administrative, uh, you know, I, man, there were times I want to slit my throat. Trying to manage contracts, trying to manage subcontracts um, was difficult. It was very, very difficult. And there were always unexpected time sinks. So we did a formal evaluation, which I'm not going to talk about in this. Um, presentation, but it took a ton of my time to work with the, the eval team. Um, planning meetings, fortunately I budgeted for this incredible staff, okay, so I had great staff, but planning meetings takes a long time. I mean, I kind of bow to David and this team after this meeting, just having had to, to organize meetings of 200 to 250 people. Um, there were always random communications, and I always love the gotta hear it from Leanne syndrome because I can't tell you how many times I would direct a staff member and say, this is the response to this question, and they would not listen to my staff member. It had to be me that they listened to. Unanticipated events, we didn't have a lot, but we did have several PI changes and moves, which was um, difficult in, in an academic environment. Um, unrealistic expectations. There were a couple stakeholders that thought we were going to like change the world um, or completely solve the norovirus problem in their commodity, and um, that was a little bit frustrating. Constant multitasking and sort of balancing research and administrative responsibilities. Um, so, um, in kind of summary, I would say how to be successful in a project like this, in managing a project like this, I really think from my perspective as the leader of this project, there's, um, I used to call this the one-third concept, okay? One-third is that I, I am kind of smart and I'm well-trained, okay? I work really hard. But I think there's this third part that has to do with how you relate to people that is not necessarily tangible. And um, I think we can try to teach it, okay, but at some level I think it's inherent in a personality to a certain extent. So advice for uh, leadership success. Um, for God's sake, choose the right collaborators. That is probably the number one, um, the number one um, piece of advice. And I had a really interesting um, situation because somebody asked me to include another collaborator, and I felt really uncomfortable including that person, but I did it as a favor, and that was the one collaborator I had trouble with. So I should have listened to my gut in that case. Um, budget for administrative staff, absolutely. I mean, um, like, I think I was budgeted for four administrative staff and I could have used a fifth. Um, be creative but relevant. Um, seeing the big picture, I think, is hugely important. Um, for God's sake, recognize what you're getting into. If you manage a project of this magnitude, this is what you're doing. You're not doing anything else but this. It's, a full, it's more than a full-time job. Um, expect the un unexpected. Um, balance communication. Um, be a good steward. I always felt like I had to make decisions for the good of the project and because I was a steward of a, a, a pretty large amount of federal funds. Um, and so I made tough decisions, but I did it because I was working, you know, on behalf of our federal government in some ways, and be decisive. And with that, I will go ahead and end with um, revisiting convergent research. Is it possible? 
Well, I think if you have vision and passion, I think if you have the right team, I think if you're able to successfully kind of abolish personal agendas and um, have the team work for the collective, um, only if there's strong leadership. And I hear this all the time in, in some um, about other collaboratives. They, they want the money, but they don't want to do the work. Okay, and, and it's only successful if you have somebody who's willing to take that responsibility. Um, only when there's enough money to do it to make it worth it. And this is an argument that I've had with USDA because they've abolished this program. And we could only do this program because there was enough money to do it. We could not have done it on a dime. And only when you have very strong, dedicated, and competent staff. And with that, I'll close. Just talk loud. OK. <laughs> uh, hello, enjoyed your presentation. And you sort of answered my question maybe in the last slide or two when you were talking about your, your time. How did you manage your time? Were you 100% dedicated to this grant, or, or was how was that sort of negotiated or managed at the university level? Huh. Good question. Um, I had enough release money so that I could buy out my teaching. Okay, so I bought out my teaching, and somebody took my teaching responsibilities. And I had a great department head who recognized that this was what I had to do. And um, he, you, you know, I still had responsibilities, committee responsibilities and things like that. But he did not put a lot of pressure on me to, to do things other than the NORACORE project. So I think those are probably the two biggies. So what's next? For me? What's the sustainability of this network? So how do you see the future of this? Well, you know, that's, um, a, terrific idea. that's a terrific question. Um, there is no more federal funding for this. And so essentially, we are out of business. Um, the only real option was to try to run the program as a university center. OK, that kind of center concept. And different universities have different ways of doing that. Um, I made the decision for my own sanity that I wasn't willing to live hand to mouth for the next five years. Um, I mean, one of the advantages of a project like this is it was $25 million for five years. And I didn't have to fundraise every year. OK, I had that money. Now, in point of fact, USDA, this was a one-shot deal for USDA. But if you look at centers that are sponsored by NSF and, and NIH to a certain extent, the idea is you have five years. If you do a good job, you're pretty much guaranteed another five years. And that just was not the case with USDA. Thank you very much, Leanne. I really appreciate it. And um, we all do your insight Thanks. on your experience. It's, uh, cool.